we're really trying to improve our links with the Don, the Division of Neuropsychology. The Don! <laughs> Best name for a division ever. Hi everyone, my name is Aika and I am a trainee clinical psychologist at Oxford. My channel is focused on psychology, mental health and everything psychology career related in the United Kingdom. So today I have Lawson with me, who's also a third year trainee clinical psychologist at Oxford. So welcome Lawson. Yeah. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I was just reflecting, it's already final year. So I'm a final year, final year trainee clinical psychologist now, even though I can't quite believe it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the Oxford course in the same cohort as ICA. I have a particular interest in clinical neuropsychology, but also LGBT plus psychology and mental health. Lawson is like a whiz kid for neuropsych, I feel, and I have no knowledge of neuropsych, so I thought it'd be quite cool to invite someone who is way more knowledgeable in that route. <laughs> who? <laughs> well, more knowledgeable than me. Everything's relative, right? <laughs> yeah. Certainly I'm not an expert, but I'm quite interested in it. Yes. And so that's why I've chosen to do my specialist placement in a head injury service. Yeah, so he wants to be a clinical neuropsychologist and you're like very much down that path now. Oxford provides that path for people who are aspiring. Yeah clinical neuropsychologists. I basically, a few months ago, sent out a poll to ask people what questions they have around Lawson's journey, questions around neuropsychology specifically that I personally probably can't answer that well, and also around like LGBTQ identities within the field of clinical psychology. And I guess I just want to add that I'm certainly not an expert in, or a neuropsychologist by any means, it's just kind of an interest of mine at the moment that I'm pursuing. Okay, so Lawson, tell us a little bit about your journey before getting onto the Doctor of Clinical Psychology, what your experiences were, why you chose this field. I think it's always a really interesting question to begin with, where if, I guess somebody's interest and opportunities for getting into psychology really start. For me, I would say that my journey isn't the kind of typical journey that you might see in other candidates. I did my bachelor's at UCL. It was quite interesting. I started on the bachelor's in just pure psychology. Mm -hmm. And then in my second year, I actually did a year abroad. So I lived in Venice for a year. Wow. Um, which was dream. excellent. <laughs> for my program, it, there was a kind of a list of institutions abroad where UCL had kind of an exchange link. Right, okay. Um, and I chose um, the most kind of... beautiful place on earth, obviously. <laughs> not, not that I'm biased. And I've always been really interested in kind of culture and kind mm -hmm. of languages. And at the time I'd studied... Lawson knows how to speak fluent Italian and a bit of Chinese <laughs> uh, for everyone who wants to feel worse about themselves. I studied like a, a year or so of Italian and um, a bit of French as well. And I thought, well, so there's wow. also no kind of better way to learn the language other than thrusting myself in the country and seeing yeah. how it goes. My partner said to me that at one point I was and um, like talking in my sleep in like in three or four languages and uh, <laughs> he turned around and, and he said to me the next day um yeah I think that, you know, there's, there's something not quite right about this I think you're pushing yourself too hard <laughs> and I kind of matched all the modules which I did with the with the content that that, that I would have done at UCL mm -hmm. to maintain the accreditation from the BPS so I, I did that year abroad and then came back at, to, to UCL in London for my what I thought was my final year had the opportunity to kind of extend mm -hmm. um, my bachelor's by a year and turn it into it like an integrated master's, okay, so an cool. MSI. And that's when I changed to psychology and language sciences. I had access to modules which otherwise I might not have had, such as rehabilitation of acquired neurogenic okay. communication, so mm -hmm. aphasia. And that was one of the first opportunities that really that I had to kind of study Case more about the brain and mm -hmm. rehabilitation. And I was like, oh, this sounds really kind of fascinating and very different to anything that I've done before. Okay. Um, so I think that was maybe the first time that it really piqued my interest mm -hmm. as a subject area. I think that I'd always been really interested in kind of not just the mind, but also the brain and kind yeah. of how the mind maps onto the brain, the brain. and vice versa. Yeah. Um, but when I had that opportunity to come back and study neurolinguistics and then also phasia rehabilitation, yeah. I think that, which otherwise I probably wouldn't have had if I hadn't yeah. gone to the language sciences part. Um, I was like, wow, this is really fascinating. And then when I did the integrated uh, master's, so the master's year, 
um, I was really fortunate because I had the chance to um, do some different placements. Um, mm -hmm. So actually most of the week I was doing kind of applied research placement. I did um, two placements, one of them was at the Anna Ford Centre okay. um, in their baby lab, kind of mm -hmm. exploring kind of mentalising. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one was, at, um, was for the Tavistock and, and Portland mm -hmm. um, in the forensic psychotherapy. Um, That's subjects. really broad experiences, yeah. like mentalization, forensic, yeah. and then you're doing a like neuro linguistic stuff academically. Yeah, and actually, my main placement um, was actually in a neuro rehabilitation mm -hmm. service, oh, okay. the community rehab service. Did that like further spark your interest into neuropsychology then? Yeah, I think it did because right. I think that that was the point that I really realised. Oh well, as kind of a psychologist in neuro, mm -hmm. you can really do so much, you yeah. really do have so much to offer, you have um, assessment skills, mm -hmm. you can work with teams, you can work with um, kind of professional carers but also mm -hmm. family systems, you can do therapy, mm -hmm. um, really just a whole kind of variety of things yeah. that you can do and I just found it a really, you, as a kind of psychologist you're in a really unique Amazing. position. So when did you decide to be to want to be a clinical like to go on to the clinical psychology route i think it's a good question i think that when i was on my bachelor's i was i, I think i really can remember quite vividly the competition and how competitive mm. everybody said it was to do clean side so after the four years what did you do so um after the four years i um i was quite lucky actually i finished my four year integrated masters and then got a job as a research assistant at the, it was employed by the Anna Freud Centre, but mm -hmm. um, based at UCL. I worked on a randomised control trial, mm -hmm. um, which was actually about mentalisation based treatment for males with a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. Wow, that's so very, family. so niche. Yeah, and it, it was a really interesting kind of pre-training experience. It was kind of research. I, I'd never been an AP mm -hmm. by the time that I was kind of offered my place for the course. Yeah, I guess that's like a typical yeah. myth of like everyone has to be an AP to get onto the course, but I think Lawson's a pretty good example that you can get such varied experiences that map onto maybe even more than what you could do as a generic assistant psychologist that like, you know, courses find super relevant. That is one thing I would really hope that people would kind of take forward after watching this is that you don't have to yes. be an AP to get a place on a, on a clinical psychology training round. Because after this research assistant job, you got onto the, yeah. he got onto the doctorate. I was a bit kind of based at UCL, but traveling around to different prisons and probation mm. offices. So I would be the person who would go and do the data collection. So okay. I was blinded as to who was in, who was receiving okay. mentalization based treatment and who was just receiving the usual probation. Like how many prisons did you visit? It, so it was based on, we had 13 NHS sites mm -hmm. and then whoever was kind of a patient in the, in the service would basically, you know, I'd see them at the probation office or the, or the prison, wherever they were. And yeah. It could have been anywhere, any of the prisons in England and Wales. Wow. So the next section is going to be around neuropsychology questions. And this section is going to be quite big, so we're just going to try zoom past as many questions as possible. So I do apologise if we don't end up answering your question. So first question someone has asked is, what exactly is a clinical neuropsychologist and how are they different to a clinical psychologist? And other variations of this question. Clinical psychologists do need to have a, some understanding of brain and I'm still learning, I guess I'm not a clinical neuropsychologist. Yeah. Maybe more of an emphasis on kind of the neurosciences and particularly those brain and behaviour yeah. relationships and also about maybe how specifically neurological conditions mm -hmm. might impact kind of individuals but also their family yeah. maybe how it might affect their work kind of kind of how work as well work mm -hmm. life and um, I guess thinking about how neurological conditions mm -hmm. um, might impact individuals and, and systems yeah. around them but equally I guess more that emphasis that you know even if somebody has a, a mental health condition and maybe they're struggling with yeah. kind of their thoughts or something mm -hmm. but, also thinking about kind of in general how cognition might be relevant there. Between right now clinical neuropsychologists and clinical psychologists, the base is clinical psychology. So you're still working with emotions, you're still using talking therapies, etc. But with, from my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, like clinical neuropsychologists is basically clinical psychologists with a specific 
interest or focus into neurological conditions, brain and behaviour, neuropsych testing. I feel like lots of people think neuropsychologists, they just do tests nice. and they're really rigid, but actually they're just psychologists who are interested in neuro and yes, they do do tests and stuff, but they also think about like family systems and much more integrative than what we'd imagine them to, or what, what I'd imagine them to be. I think you, you struck a really important point there, Riker, as well, that we're clinical psychologists first. I mean, I'm a perfect example of that. Yeah. I'm training as a clinical psychologist first, yeah. and then I'm going into neuropsychology. Yeah. The people who work in neuropsychology um, are seen as people who just, you know, do tests with them. <laughs> no emotions. No emotions. Completely <laughs> stoic. <laughs> stoic. Um, but in, in my opinion, what I've learned through training is actually those are the times where you need to use clinical skills yeah, most. Yeah, yeah. If you just do tests without the clinical psych knowledge, you would lose out on a lot of information and useful places where you can come into it. Next question is, does a declin psych qualify you as a neuropsychologist? So in short, no, it doesn't. You would typically do a doctorate in clinical psychology or you would train as a this is new, a counselling psychologist oh. or an educational psychologist. Oh, I never knew that. And wow. those professionals can access neuropsychology courses as well. Um, basically, Declan Side doesn't make you a clinical neuropsychologist, but Declan Side does allow you to work in neuro as a neuropsychologist, but not as a clinical neuropsychologist. Like, you need an extra accreditation for that, basically. Yes. But, like, yeah. in the current climate, I'm sure this will change a lot. Lots of people work in neuro rehab, neuro settings without doing that extra yeah. qualification. But that extra qualification, I guess, is just to like standardize the quality of neuropsychology provided. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's exactly it. To standardize knowledge and experience that was kind of psychologists or neuropsychologists would yeah. need to have. If you work in like medical legal stuff, you need that qualification, right? Like if you work in private, then that is something that you need, right? It's certainly something which you would put you in a better position I right. believe to do okay. that kind of work. Yeah. What should our prior knowledge or experience be if we want to get into neuropsychology? An important thing to say is that you don't have to necessarily have any specific knowledge or exp mm. experience. I mean I think that that's why you mm -hmm. can just finish your doctorate in clinical psychology and then work in neuro. Yeah. You don't need to have one you know to, to necessarily I guess be a, a neuropsychologist. But if you're interested in going into neuropsychology, then you won't need to have, a, you know, loads of knowledge beforehand, mm -hmm. um, because that will come either through. That's quite reassuring to hear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't need to know kind of. Ex, you don't need to be a clinical neuropsychologist. You don't need to know like the yeah. entire map of the brain and like how it links to like what the thalamus does. Not to start does. working in neuropsychology. I think that that's something which, you know, it's helpful to have kind of a basic understanding that you can get through training to be, you know, a clinical psychologist or educational psychologist. Yeah. Counseling psychologist. And and then you can, that will be enough to start working in those areas. Right. Um, and then you can gain experience that way. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that if you want to be a neuropsychologist quicker, you choose doctorate courses that have like the neuropsychology pathway so at oxford uh there's that pathway i don't know what other unit doctorate courses have that pathway the university of bristol offers a qualification where you can get some of your um case reports and experience recognized as accredited prior learning um through your doctorate in clinical psychology on the university of bristol website they have mm -hmm. a list of the of the universities uh, which okay. offer this I'll try to link that website down there. There's like two questions here, which is like, how do you get neuropsych experience prior to doctorate? Which Lawson is saying, you don't really need to, you'll get it whilst you're training on the doctorate. But like the second question is, maybe how do you maximize your neuropsychology experience to become a clinical neuropsychologist? And in that sense, maybe choosing a doctorate course that has that pathway like laid out for you would be very useful. Courses that help you integrate you know, near psych hours and like all that kind of stuff yeah. within training could like save you what a year. The extra training is like two years and you can like do one year in the doctorate. You can get up to a year recognized and I believe up to three case reports recognized and you will basically, your, deep, your doctoral research will be then enough. What is your 
favourite or most interesting finding from the neuropsychology field? I know that there's, for example, there's one test called the LIHR, which is a neuropsychological test which is non-verbal. Okay. Um, and one of my research projects has basically been into kind of non-verbal assessments, ah, cognitive cool. assessments. And, um, I guess I've been really shocked about how there are cognitive assessments out there which don't require you to necessarily speak Wow To be able to I still, guess that's yeah. so important for people who are mute or deaf or yeah. Aphasia Aphasia So what is the lighter test? Like do you just so it, I, <laughs> I haven't used it, I'm not an expert, but a supervisor sat me down and showed it once and you need to kind of point towards things oh. And you need to kind of go <laughs> and points. Oh, okay, so okay. Like points. a walking map. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah, you ah, like okay, that. yeah. Cool. What does the neuropsychology route on the Oxford Doctorate of Clinical Psychology route entail? Sorry, that's probably my <laughs> type of <laughs> neuropsychology route. I'm assuming is kind of the the APL, the accreditation of prior yeah. learning. So. The neuropsychology accreditation on the Oxford course, you have some additional lectures to watch, which are kind of you access through um, Bristol's online platform. And actually it's quite nice because you can watch them when it, it's convenient to you. Mm -hmm. guess do you have to do that like outside of working hours? It really depends. Um, I mean, if maybe you had a nice supervisor, they might let mm. you do it. If you were on a specialist placement in year, right, they yeah. might let you watch it a little bit because it would then lose yeah. your skills. Right? Like a cheeky lecture. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, perhaps study days. So it is like extra work. It's not yeah. like it, the, the course hasn't been like right. Like now, you're like neuro hours. Yeah, no, you would okay, have to, you would have to watch just like those squeeze it in. Squeeze somehow. it in somehow. That's additional work that you would need to do. Right. Okay. Uh, if you can, ideally, maybe write up three case reports, which are neuro ones. Okay. So you would submit everything to Bristol and then they would tell you what counts and what doesn't. Okay. But you would do a kind of a case report, which might be, for example, CBT, but you would need to ad adapt it to the cognitive profile of somebody with uh, frontotemporal dementia. Our brains are on a spectrum of all these like different cognitive profiles. Actually, there's just such a variation of like a neurocognitive profile across people in general. Like we should be... Yeah. It's just a way of formulating, right? Like yeah. neuropsychology, just like psychodynamic way of seeing things or CBT way of seeing things. It's like neuropsych is like another angle to it. Yeah. It's a really kind of good point though. It's about that idea of, you know, if somebody hasn't slept very well, of course they're not going to be able to concentrate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it's super basic stuff like that. Yeah, yeah sleep is, difficulties with sleep is something that you see across multiple mental health mm. conditions. Medication, if somebody's yeah. on medication, what are the cognitive impacts of, you know, certain medications? Mm. Um, certain mental health conditions have their own kind of neuropsychological yeah. combinations. So, for example, voice hearing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's going to impact somebody's auditory mm -hmm. attention. Yeah. So you need to be bearing that mind uh, that in mind if you're doing therapy wow. with somebody who hears voices. Okay. Next question: Do neuropsychologists <laughs> earn more? <laughs> Look at him, <laughs> dripping in uh, gold. <laughs> um, I don't know about that. Um, I mean, at least within the NHS, I think that it, we're still on the same. Mm -hmm. um, I think that increasingly in the NHS, I've heard that to go up to the higher bands, having the neuropsychology qualification like helps. Like if with you that. work in neuro, having yeah. that can help you go up. Yeah, really. to, right. go, it, to go up and, and progress yeah. through the bands. Yeah, I, I've definitely heard that multiple times through training. If there's some medical legal work that can be done as a neuropsychologist in particular. And that, in, that those are really. super lucrative. <laughs> and I think that as well in neuropsychology, it's still quite a niche area. Although we say that lots of people should always be thinking about neuropsychology, neuropsychology working with individuals and families impacted by neuro mm -hmm. conditions it's still quite niche not many people go into it, it so i think that there are there are lots of job opportunities <laughs> what do you do as a representative for the pre qualification near psychology team for the bps how does someone become involved in that another thing which i do is that i'm the pre qualification representative for the bps wow. division of neuropsychology what a snazzy title <laughs> <laughs> very snazzy i mean just like you have the pre qual group in the division of clinical psychology mm -hmm. um i just approached them the first time and i was like i'm really do you interested like, in literally just email them yeah, yeah I, I just emailed them and I was like, I'm really interested in seeing whether there are any kind of opportunities to support the group. I, I think I had a meeting with them and I said that I was quite interested in neuropsychology. One of the chairs of the of the prequel group in the DCP said, oh, well, um, we're really trying to improve our links with the DON, the Division of Neuropsychology. The DON? Yeah, <laughs> Best name for a division ever. <laughs> That is so cool. The Don. The Don. We're all Dons. You're head of the Dons. 
they kind of put me in touch with them. Um, with people in, in the dog. That's how I started it really. So when did you start, did you start it when you were pre -qual like pre-qualified? So I think it was around the time that I was kind of starting the declin side. The beginning it was very much kind of having meetings and just trying to learn how mm -hmm. the BPS system works. Yeah. Because um, it can be quite complex. I'll go to DCP pre-qual group meetings mm -hmm. sometimes and I'll, I kind of... So DCP, Division of Political yeah. Psychology, BPS, British Psychological Society, yeah. pre-qual, pre-qualification. <laughs> so many acronyms. <laughs> I will go to the DCP pre-qual meetings um, <laughs> and then I'll go to um, meetings within the DOM as well. So I'm part of the um, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion oh, cool. steering group within the DOM, the, within the DOM um, and also the PSU, which is the Professional Standards Unit within the DOM. Okay. That's where I mainly sit. Is that a lot of work? I think it I think it depends. I mean the way that it was set up for me it was kind of, you know, you're a trainee, you're very busy, kind of just give what you can. So okay. I'm trying to slot in bits with here a bit kind of here and there. Within the DCP, yeah. the pre qual group, there are lots of people who are um, pre qualification reps. So you've got AP say, you've got research assistants. Okay. Yeah. I think that the Don is increasingly this is a really good thing, is increasingly keen to hear about okay. the voices of pre qual. Mm -hmm. that there's quite a a lot of emphasis on trying to represent pre people pre qual, either whether that's in kind of research, or whether they're APs who work in neuro, and I'm okay. trying to, well, in those meetings, I'm constantly trying to think about, you know, how might this impact an AP who works in neuro? How might it impact somebody who's um, um, a trainee? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to develop a, um, a survey to send out to, for the moment, declin courses okay. to find out what kind of neuro trainees' stuff. views are about kind of neuro experiences and training. Uh -huh. I'm also quite interested in actually getting some more kind of concise, maybe even visual info about mm -hmm. the different routes into neuropsychology. When that you would be so handy. I found it confusing at the start. Yeah. Um, and I think that the DOM is really uh, kind of trying to make it easier to get into neuro. Yeah. I found it very confusing at okay. the beginning, especially if you think of trainees who were trying to mm -hmm. wrap their he heads around deep in psych courses, yeah. <laughs> and then also trying to think about, oh, well, how do I navigate this if I'm interested in going into yeah. neuro afterwards? Final question on the neuro side. Mm -hmm. Do you have any resources for we're learning all things neuro. I'm hoping to do the neuro qualification. Ooh, that's a really good question. Like, is there like a neuropsychology for dummies book or something? Um, so there are definitely books out there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What's your favorite book? <laughs> so I would recommend overcoming mild uh, traumatic brain injury. I think that that's like just a general good um, like introduction okay. to working in neuro, kind of like head injuries. And okay. Things. Okay. Could you understand it as a lady? Reader. So I have um, haven't read a lot of it because I it's only now I'm doing my specialist placement with head yeah. injuries. So I thought oh, I'm going to look into this. I've been reading it and so far it's been really accessible. Well, Headway's yeah. got lots of really helpful information um, about what is an acquired brain injury, what falls under that category. Right. Next question is thoughts of disclosing your LGBTQ identity to clients. I think sometimes I'm quite uncertain about whether to do it. Or not to mm. be honest. Um, I guess in my mind there are two things which I would think about. I guess I'd be holding kind of the, the person that I'm working with in mind, um, but also, you know, would it be helpful for them right now? But also, it, would it be helpful for me? Would it, um, do I feel does it feel kind of safe as well for me to share that part of right. you know my identity? You don't know how it might land for, yeah. for someone. Yeah. And we were talking earlier about the idea that sometimes actually sexual orientation is. An invisible, an invisible aspect of your uh, yeah, identity. Exactly. If it feels safe for you and it would be helpful for the client, then mm -hmm. perhaps, but just being mindful that it's actually, you know, in terms of aspects of your identity, it's something which is actually one of the most personal things that you're yeah. sharing. Next question, how does LGBT and neuro problems overlap? It's not really an area which has really been researched and yeah. it's something which I'm really keen on researching actually. I mean, if we're thinking about the fact that, like, about relationships and how mm -hmm. kind of Neuro conditions can have a kind of rippling impact mm -hmm. on not just individuals but families mm -hmm. and couples. Yeah. I mean, and um, one of my research projects is about couples, mm -hmm. um, and there is not very much research about how brain injuries impact couples. kind of same-sex couples, or um, you know, mm. they, I, I think you know, there's still not mu not much about how to kind of make um, neuro services maybe gender affirmative or yeah. you know these kinds of things yeah <laughs> how open are you about lgbtq stuff in teams so like with clients uh fair enough that it's a little bit more like tentative but like yeah. what about in like with colleagues i think with colleagues i still have the same question about how do i think they might react but i tend to be more open because i might have colleagues for example that i even know outside of work 
right. um, yeah. and sometimes sharing that information with colleagues can be a really good way of giving them some insight of what it's like to be a member yeah. of the LGBT community. Yeah. For example, the number of kind of straight people that might not know about the idea of the, the hetero world. What if you lived in a world uh, where being, yeah. you know, homosexual was the norm? Yeah, and heterosexual, and heterosexual yeah. It was absolutely, you know, I think that that's really interesting and I'm quite open about it. I'll ask questions, you know, well, why is it on the um, staff toilets? It's only, you, there's the slider and it's male or female toilets yeah. and why does it have to be one or the other? Okay. Um, and I think that I'll be asking these questions and even that might give them a sense of, you know, that okay. I could be more aware of the okay. issues. Okay. Do you approve of the rainbow lanyard? <laughs> Do you approve of the rainbow then? Yeah. <laughs> Do I approve? <laughs> Sorry, the way you said it was just like so serious. Um, so I, um, I do and I don't. Um, so the, my only uncertainty about the rainbow lanyard is that potentially it is associated with kind of the NHS, but then could inadvertently erase the experiences of and the views okay. of the LGBT community. Okay. Um, that whilst it's great that it's kind of promoting ideas with the NHS, yes. um, it isn't always seen in the NHS context as kind of celebrating right. LGBT okay. equality so you, and rights. So people just think it's, so a, people rainbow just think it's a rainbow for the NHS. For example, if I had come out to the team, yeah. then they would probably know that yeah. it was because you know it's a way of making kind of yeah. that aspect of my identity visible. I think that maybe in other teams, it might be just seen as just supporting the NHS. And right, I right. might be wearing it to support the LGBT community, but everyone just thinks I'm supporting the NHS. I think that ultimately, you know, people are free to you know, use whichever they like. Yeah. Um, I think that that's just something that's come to me recently. Yeah. Well, that's the end of the video. Thank you so much, Lawson, for joining me on this video and answering so many helpful and useful and interesting questions on neuropsychology and also sharing your very unique journey as well. If you enjoyed hearing Lawson's journey and story and also his advice, please leave us um, a comment down below. Say hi to maybe if you have any neuropsychology related or LGBTQ related questions feel free to comment down below as well and yeah, share your thoughts and I'd be really happy to share it with Lawson. Lawson will probably check the comments as well and we'll answer as much as we can. So really hope that you enjoyed this video. If you liked trainee chill and chat videos, please let me know and hopefully I can do more of them. See you in the future. Bye. Bye.